Oh, and Bill, with all due respect to you, I'm seeing Sarita there, who's on my list to reconnect with. <laughs> Sarita, it's so great to see your picture, at least. Hi there. Sorry, I'm in the middle of driving, but yes, thank you. Excited wow. to be here. It's a smallish group right now, and informal conversation is highly encouraged and welcome. So um, uh, Sarita it was one of our Boston Troika fellows a long time ago, then a resident at BI, and then I lost track of her. I actually haven't talked to her, um, but I saw something. She's now the president CEO of something called the Scan Foundation, which basically is like exactly spirited, aligned with us. Um, and I couldn't join earlier. They had uh, their it was annual meeting of Voices for Older Adults in California and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's just so good to see Sarita. At least her, her photo. <laughs> yeah, and it's great, and it's great to see you. I can see you. I just uh, sorry, I won't. You won't be able to see me. I'm in transit, but thank you. A great conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Connected in the past myself with Scan Foundation. I don't remember yeah. exactly what, but it was positive. Well, well, and, and, and this is Pauline Zikos. I'm very pleased to have uh, to read involved. Scan Foundation is one of the, the nation's leading. Uh, organizations focus on the uh, the dignity and, and concerns of older adults. So well, welcome. I think my work was through Community Catalyst, I believe, quite perhaps. Do we want to give it one more minute, folks? Yeah, and it's going to be recorded so people can, you know, See the recording later, but I would I would love to have us get going because we we want to spend some time on origins of Dignity Alliance, how this all started out of like the darkness of the peak you know COVID epidemic here in Massachusetts. But um, I forget Paul or Bill who is going to go first, and and then we'll talk. Mr. Okay. Henning. All right. Well, today I want to welcome everybody to um, the Dignity Alliance of Massachusetts Dam, as we call it. We are um, commemorating World Dignity Day, which is an event put on worldwide, really, by a group called Global Dignity. And I'll just read what it's all about from a website, really. They say it better than I ever could in my own words. It's an annual celebration around the world. Uh, to encourage everybody where, wherever to understand what dignity is, the innate and equivalent worth of everyone and how they can work for and secure the dignity of others through activities big and small. The Dignity Alliance arose during the pandemic um, in the late spring, really. It didn't acquire its name till much later in 2020, but in the late spring of 2020, when the pandemic had exploded across the Commonwealth, was the cause of much tragedy in nursing facilities. And a number of activists, advocates got together saying, we need to really look at what's going on in facilities, why there's an institutional bias, how we can promote more dignified settings for elders, people with disabilities who are in uh, nursing homes, nursing facilities, um, and not to say that the workers in such facilities don't want their own dignity, don't try to ensure the dignity of the people who reside there because it's our observation that they absolutely do, but it is a system that's a bit anachronistic and it may have never an anachronistic suggest it had a place once and I'm not, I would argue it's never really had a place for effective care, but it's a system we have to, system a lot of us want to work for to change but we have to also be respectful that there are over 30,000 people in the state of Massachusetts living in facilities and that you're not going to transition the system overnight so we also fervently work in the dignity alliance to ensure better living conditions for the people who reside there and for the workers as well um, and Paul I, I turn it over to Paul Lanzikos who's been really the superstar of the Dignity Alliance and a man with a resume and work around elder affairs that's too long to recite in a meeting today that will end at five o'clock, but Paul. 
Uh, well, thank you, Bill. Um, about uh, I made a mistake about 18 months ago at the, at the beginning of the pandemic. I I uh, I answered my telephone and on the other end was Bill Henning and he said, <laughs> we've got to do something about the fact that uh, the state is trying to dislocate nursing home residents to create COVID care, um, dedicated uh, care facilities. Um, we felt that was wrong for a number of reasons, not the least which with public health concerns, but even more importantly, the rights and dignity of the people that were currently in, the, in, in those uh, nursing facilities. Um, and um, we raised our voice and um, fortunately the Commonwealth saw the error of its ways after the first attempt and uh, held to that practice. But then the, the half a dozen or so of us who were engaged back then said, yeah, you know, when this pandemic ends in a couple of months, <laughs> uh, little do we know, 18 months later, we're still in the midst of it, um, that we can't return to business as usual in the provision of necessary services, support and care for older people um, people with disabilities, as well as the, the, the people who provide the care. Um, looking specifically at our nursing facilities, um, they haven't changed in well over half a century. Um, uh, I know folks will find it hard to believe by looking how young I am, but I've been engaged with uh, um, um, long-term care for um, about 50 years now. And uh, virtually nursing facilities have not changed throughout all that time. It's the same basic model, both a business model as well as a clinical model. And so much else in, in, in life has evolved. Uh, we think it's well past time that um, the, the provision of long-term services, support and care, whether it's in congregate settings like nursing facilities and, um, and rest homes or in, the, uh, in people's own homes in the community um, needs, needs to be well into the 21st century. Um, uh, for their well-being, but basically for their dignity. And that's at the heart of what we've been about uh, <clears throat> these uh, last 18 months. It's um, recognizing the, what is the essence of being human. That is our, each and every one of our dignities. Uh, that's the right to, um, to, to, to express our, our, our needs and concerns, to have our choices respected, and to be, is, to be autonomous in the way we uh, live our lives independent of whatever circumstances may uh, befall us physically or otherwise. Um, so during this, this period of time, a number of us, we've grown from that um, half a dozen folks uh, 18 months ago to uh, well over 200 people who uh, uh, regularly um, are invited to participate uh, in our bi-weekly Zoom sessions in well over 500 people who participate by receiving our, our weekly um, uh, communication called the, uh, the Tuesday Digest. And we'll talk more about that at the end of the session. But uh, we thought um, that in recognition of World Dignity Day, um, that we would um, invite folks, some, some of you who have been actively involved with us for, for from the very beginning or for many months. And some of you who um, uh, uh, may be very new to, um, and this is the first time having any interaction with uh, uh, the D Dignity Alliance uh, Massachusetts and the, and the various folks involved with it. But uh, we thought it would be, uh, be valuable to have a, a dialogue, a conversation, very open-ended without, uh, it's not scripted, it's not um, agended as we do in our, our bi-weekly sessions. Uh, to to share with each other what um, dignity uh, means to us personally, and, and more importantly, you know how dignity should shape uh, public policies, um, our clinical and pr programmatic protocols, and and the way those of us who um, either from from time to time or ongoing uh, need the, the the support of others in order to um, to optimize um, our own circumstances. So, uh, so we're, we're glad to have you all here. Um, um, and as they say, there's, there's no particular agenda. What we'll do, um, just so we, we're not all talking over each other, we'll use the, um, the hand raise feature. Um, if, um, if you'd like to, to um, um, contribute in the conversation and, um, and we'll, we'll see where we go. Uh, yeah, and I'd just like to give a shout out to 
Lachlan, Priscilla, and Samantha who helped set this up too. I think we would be remiss. They put a lot of thought and effort into this and the importance of dignity and as we do our work to remember what really drives all of us. And then I'm gonna give a quick shout out to Bill and Paul because when peak, peak pandemic, you know, uh, last March, April, and I was trying to figure out, is there anything I could do to be helpful with elders? Ruth Baltzer, the house co-chair of elder affairs is my uh, uh, representative and asking other people, it's clear that um, so many people are trying to do so many things that someone like me, mostly hospital-based, didn't have things to add, but, um, but Ruth um, uh, said, well, there's one person that you actually really should connect with, uh, Paul Lancigos, and at that point I didn't. And so then uh, when I heard from Paul about this and then saw Bill Henning, uh, because uh, through you know, 11 years ago, through Lisa Izzoni, who's with us when I chaired a state expert panel on so-called end-of-life care, um, uh, uh, and that's a concern for people with disabilities, Lisa said, you got to meet this guy, Bill Henning. Um, and so the uh, one of the uh, people, my state rep said, for anybody interested in elder, older adults, Paul is the guy. And most of us know for anybody interested in people with disabilities, Bill is the guy, but that wasn't actually enough. Um, hearing that from the beginning, they said not just older adults, people with disabilities, but the people who care for and support them, um, unpaid family members, and then the staff who are mostly people from communities of color, this seemed like a three for united by this concept of dignity. Um, and it's just been a joy to be part of this. And uh, I'm gonna stop here because we wanna hear from other people about what you see, hope for, um, uh, and how we can work together. And I just would say, noting that John Kelly is on the call, there's no stronger champion around people with disabilities and where it intersects with end of life care or issues of aid and dying. So I, I, I wouldn't for a second try to take, accept anything that would. Uh, yeah, John, come, great to John, see you. John's doing. role and Arlene has just been a champion. So, but on everything too. So, yeah. Okay, well, enough from us. We'd like to turn it yeah. over to, to all of you. Um, in, in the interest of time, we're not going to go around and ask everyone to introduce themselves right now, but we would invite you the first time you speak. If you choose to, you don't have to, uh, just you know, say your name and um, any comment you like to, that could be introductory um, about yourself. So who would like to kick this off? I know we've got a lot of sh very shy people here, but no. Priscilla's Priscilla. hand is up. Go, Priscilla. Um, I'm Priscilla O'Reilly. I worked with Paul and Lillian a million years ago at Executive Office of Elder Affairs. And I, I just um, I just wanted to just think about dignity personally. I just um, tell a story about my two grandmothers. So I had one grandmother who had plenty of money and she was able to live in her apartment in New York City. She had round the clock nursing care. And when she needed more care than that, she moved into a really beautiful facility that she actually thought she owned. Um, and because a lot of the ladies who lived there were women that she entertained throughout her, her, her life. Um, their husbands had gone and she was there and she had a very peaceful ending. And then my other, my father's mom didn't have any money. Um, she was pretty poor and uh, she broke her hip and my aunt couldn't take care of her. And she moved into a facility that was a as my father would have described it as being dreary. Um, and my father had six kids. He would drive to see her every day on his way to work and every day on the way back. Um, he, the best he could to thank and recognize the caregivers, but she had a couple of roommates, you know, that would rotate and, and they had some behavioral issues. And so she was sort of afraid to live in the, in the room with them. And she died on Christmas Eve when she was 98. And I just, feel like her last, she was there for almost a couple of years. And just, it was so sad that she didn't have dignity when she, in her last days. And I just thought that dichotomy was just so hard to see. Um, so I just wanted to share that personally. Thank you, Priscilla. Go ahead, Arlene. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Arlene Germain, and I'm the 
uh, co-founder and policy director for the Massachusetts Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. And I'm also a co-founder along with Paul and Bill. And uh, at the time, um, Allison Weingartner um, was our executive director and we were working together. The pandemic had just started and it was so intense. You know, the whole world came down around nursing home residents and the issue that was mentioned about nursing home residents being kicked out of the facility that the, um, we were working on. And then we got a call from Paul saying, with, you know, he was concerned and we joined forces and, you know, we do think we were able to stop there were, uh, the state, I don't know if you all remember, they were trying to uh, um, really kick out nursing home residents from their home to have a dedicated COVID facility. And as if there weren't any other, is you know, any other issues or any other options. And I think you probably understand that anytime that you move a nursing home resident that way, it's, it's looked at as um, an eviction. And the nursing home resident quite often will become ill from transfer trauma, from anxiety, from a lot of different um, reactions to being forcibly removed from everything that they know, because they do feel that that one bed in that one room <laughs> is their home. Um, so we did fight together. Um, Dignity Alliance has been an amazing opportunity um, for our organization uh, to join forces with the um, disability community. And I think that's critical in, in Dignity Alliance. Um, on, a, on a personal level, I've had eight loved ones um, in nursing homes over the past about 25 years, from my mother um, to my dearest girlfriend who um, had early onset dementia. So I've seen over the past 20 years, um, sadly, as much as we're fighting, and there are many of us fighting on a, a statewide and national level, that nursing home care is not where we want it to be. Um, we want it, a nursing home to be the home of somebody who needs that kind of care. And that's what Dignity Alliance is, is fighting for. Um, so I view dignity as um, was just said that you have to be able to maintain your, your personal self um, and your quality of life, the best quality of life possible, no matter where you're living, so. I see, Lily, thank you, Arlene. Um, superstar champion for the rights of people in facilities. Uh, I, I see uh, Lillian Glickman's hand raised, who oh, I haven't excellent. seen in a long time. <laughs> right, thanks, Paul. Uh, like Paul, I'm a former Secretary of Elder Affairs, and I go back many years, um, and I remember about 55 years ago, and Bill probably remembers this, working with Frank Manning, mm -hmm. um, who was trying for the first time to organize um, both the elder and disability communities and bring them together jointly on many issues, including nursing homes and dignity issues across, um, across the board. And uh, I'd like to think we've made some progress since then, and certainly we have, um, but it still impresses me how far we have to go at this point, uh, even 55 years later. You know, one of the things Willie, and that had me ranting and raving in those few months I quarantined, which was just very briefly at home. But my, my, my wife experienced a daily slew of strong language about what was happening to people in nursing homes. There was, I, I, to this day, I feel they were acceptable casualties in the general mindset. And I, I feel it to this day, the expendability of people with disabilities and elders who were in facilities. And that's why we've been able, deaths still continue, but that, you know, we shift on who's gonna get a vaccine, who's this about people in a so-called mainstream community. I think the work is imperative, even if we've seen the census and facilities declined maybe by 100% over the last 30 years in the state, 
we still have much to do. Um, so yeah, thank you. But and it's great, great to see you, Lillian. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought up Frank Manny. And you could also mention Elsie Frank and Marilyn Gerard. When I was uh, secretary way back when, um, actually, I so Lillian sort of sandwiched me. She was assistant secretary before me, and then she became assistant sec became secretary after me. Um, I was like the baloney in the middle. Um, the uh, but the, the those folks they had the vision, um, they had the commitment, they had the dignity, um, and they had so much dignity that they they wanted to make sure everybody. Um, um, was able to um, um, enjoy um, the, the fullness of, of their own uh, personhood. Um, so fo fo folks like Elsie and Frank and Merlin um, led the way. And I, I'm going to just add a, a, my own additional personal uh, perspective. I had the good fortune um, of knowing well every one of my grandparents. In fact, even my great grandmother um, on, my, on my mother's side who lived to be 103 years old, but every one of my grandparents lived in to be at least 90. Um, and my last um, living grandparent was my, my grandmother um, who lived um, uh, until she was 93. And I was at the time uh, 54 when she died. And, uh, and she, she lived, for me, she um, she was the personification of what dignity is about. Um, she um, it, um, had two children, my mother and my uncle, um, and became a single parent when her husband left um, um, and abandoned the family uh, and when the kids were still young. And my grandmother had to go to work um, as an expert seamstress um, uh, back in the 40s. And um, she worked in her entire life. She was a union member. Uh, and she uh, worked uh, well into her 70s, earning her own way uh, and, and raising her children. Um, and then I also had the, the, uh, the good fortune of marrying into a, a, um, my wife's family. Um, and, um, and they were also just wonderful representations of what dignity was. And um, my, my mother-in-law who just died a few years ago um, uh, was, her, was a businesswoman and her, ran her own bridal business until she was 83 years old. And uh, up until about a month before she died, she did Sudoku every day and she balanced her checkbook to the penny. Uh, so those were my role models. Um, and and that, that's given me the motivation to, um, to do what I can to, to um, uh, make sure everybody has that opportunity to, to, to live that type of life to, their, to the fullest. Um, so with that being said, let's see who else would uh, like to share their perspective. And I'm not gonna be afraid to call on people because I see a lot of folks here who- <laughs> and Chris's hand is up. Chris, Chris Chris's oh, hand is up. There you go, Chris. Say, so introduce yourself, Chris. Yeah, I'm um, a 57-year-old man with dark black glass, black glasses <laughs> on, wearing a black shirt um, in a power wheelchair in my home. Um, and, a, and, and, a, and a well and a recognized second grade teacher of the, the year, a very honored teacher in his, in his, in his, so, in yeah, his and history. That's, well, before I, I, so four and a half years ago, I had a spinal cord injury um, and I didn't really understand um, um, how dignity from the perspective of a person um, who, with a disability as a person who's not, who didn't have a lot of the privileges that I had um, from my, because of my circumstances and my gender and my race, um, but I immediately realized that for me to be independent and have the life that I wanted, I would be dependent on others um, and um, on resources. And one of the things that really I really appreciate about the Dignity Alliance 
is that it brings together three groups, um, older adults, people with disabilities, and the people who care for them, all of us. Um, and in order, uh, and that dignity is individual. I'm going to, you know, I, I need special uh, physical attention that some people would think would be undignified, but it's fine, it's what I need. And people define their, what they need in, as an individual. And we have to have the supports for our caregivers as well, because without them, we wouldn't be able to have this level of, uh, of independence that we have. Um, so I appreciate the way that, that that's been brought together. And also the breadth, I learned so much from all the other, from the other members of the Alliance. And, and I will again, thank you all for your deck, many of you for your decades of service. I'm a beneficiary of that work, um, but there's so much more um, to do. So thanks again, and look forward to listening to others. Thank you, Chris. Who else is sharing their perspective? Jerry, Jerry. how about that? Unmute yourself, Jerry. And after that, I see Posey. Yeah, it's rare that I'm muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, no comment, Jerry. That, no, that's all right. I, I, I know I can. <laughs> I can be Your voice difficult. is loud and essential. Thank you, Bill. And, and um, those of us in the boondocks respect you and, and your group for what you're doing. Um, I Look, I, I'm a little bit um, external to the focus, primary focus of Dignity Alliance, but I share many, if not all, of your goals and of our goals and, and um, uh, what we seek for. Um, I think dignity is something that people can have despite miserable situations. Um, I'm thinking about a lifetime ago when I spent a summer doing research among um, Diné, uh, otherwise known as Navajo Native Americans. Um, they didn't have a lot, but they would, at least the elders possessed a sense of identity and dignity, um, unparalleled. Um, my concerns the last few years have been as you probably all know, elderly and disabled in housing, uh, public and dis, um, subsidized housing, which is not much different from what I hear from people in, um, you know, wealthy um, uh, communities. Um, there's a lot of nastiness, a lot of harm, a lot of bullying and, and abuse, and people need people need to be respected. Um, and I think that's the flip side of, or the same thing, it seems to me, of, as, as dignity. Um, and, you know, just before I came to the, this meeting, I was chatting with one of my former tormentors. It was a, a, a very excellent bully. I learned a lot about bullying from him. But, you know, we're, it's calmed down. And he was saying, you know, what's the point of fighting the system? We're old. Nobody's ever going to give us the respect that we deserve or, or the services that they get paid to provide. Um, and, they, and, and a new active person in our group uh, um, is... Uh, to me, a younger woman, she's about 45. She's got multiple disabilities and has had them all her life. And what I learned, and Lisa 
from your predecessor, Mary Margaret. This decency and good and what to love in every person, regardless of their age or so-called disabilities. And this young woman um, is bright and competent and you know in the few weeks that i've known her she's taken on a, a, a leadership role and help helped us in our legislative ag advocacy but she's got a disability that her body cannot regulate temperature and the landlord refuses to give her an accommodation, which is just to shut off the heat in her apartment. And so she testified last Wednesday, having had to go to the emergency room for uh, her kidneys shutting down because of the dehydration but due to the heat and the, the lack of relief. And the disrespect, the lack of response in, in to existing laws and regulations it's just so frustrating and it, it well I'm, I'm i'm preaching to the choir you all you all know that it just it's so widespread in our society so every effort like you're making in this group is so important um and i know you're focused on specific populations we are t you know we're on a different segment of the population it's the same problem and we all have to um, support each other and, and work towards, you know, mutual respect. Uh, thank you. As, as usual, I've said too much, but no. it's always good to be with you. You said it very well, Jerry, in the very uh, poignant illustrations. And uh, for the folks who don't know, Jerry is the uh, founder and head of the Stop Bullying Coalition uh, focused on folks living in um, various housing uh, buildings. So thank you, Jerry. Posey. Yes, hi, I'm Posey Mansfield. And about 11 years ago, I lost my leg to an infection above the knee. And I came from a family that had, had means and I had access to, to good health care and I had access to coming and going as I wanted. And 11 years ago, a lot of things changed in my life. I found out, first of all, that it's not an accessible world. I, my husband had just died a month earlier before I lost my leg and I was living in Lynn in a townhouse. There were stairs, I couldn't get up and down stairs. And so I had to move. My kids wanted me to move in with one of them and I told them that that would get old very quickly. So I said, no, I'll live on my own. So I went into senior housing and I didn't ask for a handicapped apartment, but I found that my life had been altered more than I realized. The fact that I had come from a family from from a, a family of means didn't make any difference. It's not. It wasn't accessible to me to go out to a store to try to open a door that was too heavy. I wear a prosthesis, and I I don't. I at that time I was using crutches, and doors were heavy, hard to open. Um, there were boxes packed and stacked on, on in aisles. I couldn't get around them. If, I would get one of those motorized wheelchairs in the, in the store lots of times. The, the, uh, you know, the, the, the boxes that were stuck in the, in the middle of the aisles, I couldn't get around. Uh, people wouldn't get out of the way. People wouldn't help me. People uh, just, I was just invisible. And I'd never been invisible before. I'd never been invisible. And I've, I've done a lot of things in my life. And I think I've accomplished some things. And I started to Work group for APTs, and I realized that everybody was experiencing the same thing. We didn't have access to proper proper prosthetic care. We didn't have access to to housing. Uh, we didn't have access to proper medical care. And when people who had lost limbs uh, were older, as I was, I was sixty two. And when you're older and you're later in life and you lose a limb, you're used to. I was used to walking on my on two legs for 64, 62 years. Suddenly, I found that I couldn't do as many things for myself, and I needed help. And that help wasn't always available. And if it, if it, in the members of my group, they would tell me that 
they would seek help from a PCA or from um, an agency to get home health care in to help with showering. And they sometimes had aides that wouldn't show up. They had times when uh, the, it was too much. They had, to, they had to pay a housekeeper. It wasn't covered by insurance. They had to pay a housekeeper to come in and, and help them. They had to get help with showering. They didn't always have feel that they were they were being shown dignity. Dignity to me, to me means the right to access to services. And that's something that I have not been able to get and the people in my group have not been able to get because there isn't access to all of those things in real life. Uh, I couldn't find accessible housing. I'm still, I'm, I moved to Essex. I'm not in a handicapped accessible apartment. I recently had hand surgery and the bathroom door door is not wide enough for a wheelchair to get through. And I only have one bathroom on one floor and I had to rent a wheelchair and I had to get a child size wheelchair because the, the door frame is too narrow for a regular size wheelchair to fit through. And I had to rent a wheelchair um, or I'd have to buy a wheelchair. Uh, it's hard to, to find a wheelchair. I could get one from the local COA, but they, they're too wide. You can't get one that's narrow. And so I had to hire, uh, I had to rent a wheelchair. Um, I, no, I had to buy a wheelchair. The, the, the uh, Disability Resource Center bought me a wheelchair that was narrow enough to get into my bathroom. And I don't have grab bars. And when I talked to the landlord, he said he's grandfathered in. He doesn't have to have accessible, accessible bathrooms. You know, he's very nice, but he he doesn't have to go around and at his expense retrofit my apartment or adapt it to my needs. This is also true um, of of when people go to get get their license again after they lose a limb, they can't find a driver's ed program that will train them because you have to be certified to get your license again if you've lost a limb. They can't find a, a, a driver's ed program that will train them to drive with their left foot if they have their right leg amputated. They can't, they aren't, they aren't around, you just can't find them. And so, so it's dignity to me means access. It means the right, right to be seen, the right to be heard, the right to have access to services that aren't always available. And the Dignity Alliance is addressing those issues. And for that, I'm very grateful. And just as Chris, Chris said, I'm a beneficiary of that. And the people in my group who I advocate for are beneficiary, beneficiaries of that. And we're not gonna see change anytime soon, but we, the work we do is important because change will come. It won't come without advocates, advocates like, like us. And that's why it's so important to advocate for yourself but there are people that can advocate for themselves. We have to be their voice. We have to be their advocate because many people with disabilities are invisible. They don't have a name. They don't have anything but a, a number in a nursing home in the, in the, in the, in, over their bed. And that's what, that's what dignity means to me. Thank you, Posey. Go ahead, Bill. I was gonna say, thank you, Posey. No, but it's very strong, and I also uh, see Wing Gerhard with her hand up. Uh, yes, hi everyone. Um, I'm Wing Gerhard, and I just want to first say that um, I've had the privilege of working with Arlene Germain and Alice Weingartner and Frank Baskin, um, and uh, through my work at um, Elder Legal Services, the Greater Boston Legal Services, for 34 years, um, and. Um, I uh, learned a lot and from that group, and I think we foreshadowed some of what is happening now in the larger Dignity Alliance. Um, and uh, I just feel very privileged to have um, been able to learn from and work with that great group of people over the years. But um, I, as I said, was a um, elder legal services attorney at Legal Services for many years, doing um, nursing home work and guardianship work. Um, and so I saw a lot of uh, my clients over the years who uh, were not respected and did not have their rights honored. Um, and so I guess as my career and as a lawyer, um, I, I think dignity means a lot, but it, I think the first thing it means is to have your rights as a human being respected and uh, both in terms of your own just independence and capacity, as well as your legal rights. Um, 
and uh, your right to have the law, you know, enforced to protect you, um, because the populations that we all deal with are vulnerable um, and have capacity, have their own uh, way of expressing themselves, certainly. But as advocates, um, I always feel like it's important to just go back to that um, right to have protective laws and um, due process laws, laws respected and enforced. And um, many of my clients uh, were in nursing homes and quite a few of them were also under guardianship, which means that they were basically uh, had lost all their rights uh, and were institutionalized, uh, despite the fact that the law prevented or had language that could have prevented that. So um, I think that seeing those kinds of clients over the years and being able to help them uh, both to enforce the law, but also to expand the laws um, where there was where there were gaps and where there was still a lack of dignity and a lack of, of, of rights. Um, to me, that was why I did the work. Uh, and I think some of the examples had to do with things some of you are familiar with, which uh, one of which is what we called nursing home dumping or nursing home evictions, um, which happened all too often um, with uh, plans to charge people to homeless shelters, pretty outrageous things that we saw over and over again. And, um, you know, the, the law actually had uh, rights in there that would prevent that, but it did happen. So, and we know we didn't hear about all the instant instances out there. So um, I guess that's my experience with enforcing rights and um, expanding the law where it needs to be. And that's what we're, you know, that's what this large coalition is all about. Um, so I started with our small coalition. It's been a great journey to this wonderful uh, Dignity Alliance. So thanks. Thanks, Wynne. Um, your work has been amazing uh, from the legal services all these decades. Thanks. Anyone else want to volunteer comment? Someone, someone new, someone we don't always hear from. How about if we hear from someone out west, like Judy Fonz? I saw someone else's eyes perk up too that I know well from out in Western Mass. And then we <laughs> have it. Just, just reveal no. Out west for people in Boston means, <laughs> means Berkshire County, not <laughs> California. <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm... Uh, no, some people out here, it means Framingham. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in Franklin County. I'm Judy Fonge. I'm a retired social worker. Um, and I live in the town of Leverett, which is close to UMass, um, but obviously west. Um, so for me, I, I've been thinking about this as we've been talking and well, actually, let me stop because I really first want to take this opportunity to thank Dignity Alliance, um, because I have the chance to do that, because they were the people who came to rescue, to hope to rescue the Fair and Care Center. And I'm so appreciative of all the time and effort that went into this and still so angry and furious that EOHHS and DPH had no clue what they were doing. And so, although we spent tons and tons of time trying to prevent it from closing, um, you know, we weren't successful and all, many of our fears have happened in this new place called Mission Care. But for me, I think it's around, um, I've worked with people with, with um, serious mental illness, lived experience for about 45 years. And so my work really is, has always been about trying to find respect um, and dignity for those people that I've worked with. Because um, as many of you know, that's a group of people that don't get much respect and therefore don't have much dignity. And I didn't, you know, as we were talking, it became clearer to me, you know, that um, has always been, um, why I've done this work. Um, I never thought I was going to do it. I went to a state hospital for an internship, Northampton State Hospital, and just was so surprised. I was ready to run out the door before I got there. And it turned out that, you know, I found a way to really make a difference, I hope, in people's lives and create the dignity that many times that they don't have. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Who's up next? I can uh, be a, a new person, a new face kind of to the group and another well, person from the West. Well, um, my welcome, name is Sally. Sally. 
Hi, yeah, so my name is Sally English and I'm, um, I'm one of the kind of silent supporters of this group. Um, I wish I could attend more meetings. I'm very passionate about the cause. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working at BCIL. Um, I now work for uh, an agency called Viability in Hamden County, Massachusetts, and I run our clubhouse programs, which are for adults with serious mental illness. Um, but part of my passion for being supportive of this group is um, the experiences that I've had with my parents. And while we're all talking about dignity, um, and there are kind of the big pieces and the main sticking points about, you know, having access to, to housing that you that's adequate and everything. A lot of what I think about is um, my father, who um, had a stroke, a serious stroke and um, type two diabetes and was um, ended up in a nursing home for the last years of his life. Um, but those years in the nursing home, as much as I hated having him there, um, actually ended up being wonderful, partially because the staff took the time to know him um, and to allow him the things that to him gave him his dignity. When he wanted to nap, he could nap. And he had been in and out of nursing homes and rehabs all over the state for years where they were like, you have to be up at this time. You have to go here at this time. You have to do this at this time. Will you go to the bathroom at this time? But the people that supported him there, while the actual model of it is not good, they were so um, understanding of him they knew that he loved chocolate and they didn't care that he had type 2 diabetes and that it might push his sugar up as long as it stayed within a certain level. They made, they let him have his chocolate because that's what he loved and that's what made him happy. Um, they were good about always making sure he had clean clothes on. Uh, if he needed something, they let me know so I could get it for him. Um, and they allowed his friends to come in to take him out to do everything with him. And I think to me, like those are little pieces of dignity um, that again, while we need to change the overall structure of what's happening that can be preserved. Um, and I also think um, conversely, uh, of, again, in a situation where you know dignity has, has kind of been taken away if my mother who has Parkinson's um, and um, went through falling sprees um, very frequently and was in an assisted living facility. And um, it got to the point where the staff were trying to tell her like, no, you can't walk because you're going to fall. All my mother ever wanted to do in her retirement was to go on walking tours. And when she realized that wasn't going to be possible because of her, her Parkinson's, all she wanted was to live somewhere where she could walk, even if it was just up and down the halls. And to have that taken away from her hurt more than a lot of other pieces of having to live in, in an assisted living when she was, you know, she moved there when she was in her 60s. Um, so I think sometimes when, you know, in dignity, it's also about, about knowing those little things about pieces of people that make their lives worthwhile and worth living and figuring out ways to preserve that. Um, because when, when they have those, you know, it's, it just makes a huge difference in the day to day. Um, so I think those are, are just a couple of things that I think of, um, as, as little pieces, you know, that make a difference in people's lives. Thank you, Sally. Thank you very much for sharing. It's been a tough ride, I know, but it has its good points too. Lachlan and then John Kelly. Um. Yeah, um, Sally, thank you so much for that. It kind of uh, relates to one of the things I was going to say, reflecting on not just what I've learned and heard from so many people in Dignity Alliance and others before, um, but my own experience for years is with my wife, Susan, is the main support for my younger sister who had uh, a serious mental illness, although she'd been a successful teacher before that. Um, and in and out of the best facilities, psychiatric facilities in the world, according to all the rating kinds of things. Um, and uh, so often um, for her, but for so many other people that get labeled as disabled or old or whatever, um, they're then just seen as dependent, unable to do anything for themselves. Um, and when they're insulted and their dignity is insulted in that way, then they withdraw or uh, get angry and then we have actually destroyed the capacities that they have still 
not just to live a life for themselves, but to contribute to others. Um, one of the things that a number of us have learned from Lisa Izzoni is with us and others, for example, is um, uh, many, if not most people with mobility problems do not consider themselves even disabled as long as they have the mobility support that they need. Um, it's not them that's disabled, it's the lack of the resources, and it's not just the lack of the resources uh, that allow them to do something for themselves in their own life, it's the resources that allow them to actually have the dignity of contributing to the lives of others, whether it's out in the community or family or visiting other ways. And it just, um, to be blunt, just pisses me off so much that a lot of the difficulties that we have are caused by the systems that further disable people, make it even harder for them to contribute. And then we point to them and say, see, they're completely dependent uh, and it's a downward spiral. And we just need to, if we can twist that, reverse it upward, there is so much more richness in this Commonwealth for people can, to contribute that we're depriving ourselves of. Um, uh, and hearing from all of you just energizes me to uh, try to make things different and better than it, it was for my sister, um, who even with no limit in financial resources from my parents, and th there aren't advocates more knowledgeable than me, it sucked so often. It's just infuriating. Thank you, Lachlan. And before we turn to you, John, I just, one thing you just said, Lachlan, made me think about something very, very profound that Chris Roy said a um, number of meetings ago, um, which resonated, that he said he was not disabled because he uses a wheelchair. He becomes disabled when the chair, wheelchair is not available to him. Yeah. John? Um, well, this has been a really fascinating meeting and uh, thank you everyone. I like uh, Chris and everyone's been uh, sure to talk about how much we have benefited from the work of other people. And so, you know, when I became disabled, I, um, I was humiliated by the physical needs of having a spinal cord injury. And, you know, like Chris said, it's, we, you know, there's sort of a, a matter of factness and being grounded in just everyday reality that, um, and that, you know, that what we need is fine and everyone uh, deserves the equal amount of respect. And that's the, you know, the basis for a democratic society, unfortunately, we, we live in a society in which uh, some people are valued more than others and dignity is a highly contested term um, that for, uh, you know, the original meaning is being judged worthy by others. And it's kind of an upper class term. And so if you look up dignity, you'll see that it means being in control and contained and, um, and that goes against what it means to be disabled. So I really admire the Dignity Alliance's work to try to reclaim it. But, you know, I see the word dignity most often in terms of death with dignity, which is a value judgment that it's better to be dead than disabled. And it's something that uh, I've been fighting against, mm -hmm. you know, ever since I really uh, learned about skills in independent living from BCIL, just to, you know, I can say that I'm the poster boy for uh, better dead than disabled. Mm -hmm. And that's called a death with dignity. And so, you know, it's great. I, I hope that we are able to reclaim it. Mm -hmm. But as long as people can be said to lose dignity, um, it, I, I think we remain in danger. Thank you.
you know, I'm, John, I'm so glad you, you made that reference to um, you know, death with dignity because at the very beginning of um, our, the effort, we, there was a lot of discussion as to what we would call um, the effort. And um, when it was proposed, you know, dignity or dignity alliance, we went back and forth on that because it, because of dignity at that time, what still is, is associated with the assisted suicide and it has all the connotations that you, you just referenced. But Paul Spoon, I think, um, said this very well. He said, just, just you, as you have, we need to reclaim that, that term, that concept. Um, it, and, and to the fullness of what it is to be human. And um, I'm just, I'm looking at the list. Um, we, um, some of you have actually have already responded that uh, I would hope uh, many of you will to the survey that we sent out um, about um, what dignity means to, um, to you. Um, and if you, if you haven't received it, I'd be happy to, to send it out. Um, um, but one of the responses came back, the ability to live your life on your own terms uh, so it's essentially dignity is the essence of being human, uh, in, in being autonomous, uh, being able to, to to have your your free will in your 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 expectations, your wants, your desires to um, be be pursued um, no matter what your circumstances. We've got um, we're coming up close to five. We don't want to overstate um, stay uh, welcome. Um, so, but uh, we're going to give opportunities for anybody. Um, maybe with a close. Oh, oh I, Ellen, I was hoping that you were going to uh, chime in. Uh, Ellen DePilo. Thank you, Paul. I, I can't seem to raise my electronic hand. So um, thank you so much. I'm Ellen DePilo from Honoring Choices, Massachusetts. And it's so wonderful to hear this. Um, and I, do, I, I just really want to just uh, mention, especially in light of what John Kelly just said, that we actually have an opportunity to start to reclaim some of this. I think, from, in my opinion, um, Lachlan Faro has been at the forefront of moving us towards, um, for many years now, um, an expert panel on end of life care and serious illness. And the state, after many years um, of, of not having a really good serious illness care program and a way to communicate choices in a MULS program, we're finally going to move from a MULS program to a PULSE program. And what that just means is that um, we're going to follow in the footsteps of many states across the country who have learned to build standards that come from the voices of people, not just from the state down, but from the, 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 the dignity and the, the, the right of people to say what they want for care. And our job as care providers and, and state and the courts is to be able to try to get us that care. So what's wonderful right now, um, the state is in the very beginning process of moving to this program and they're looking and they want stakeholder voices and consumer voices. We've not talked a lot about people voices, but um, at Honoring Choices Massachusetts, that's our focus is consumer voice. Um, and I just wanted to make mention of it. You'll hear much more about it. We'll make sure that the Dignity Alliance has the best information as soon as it starts to move forward a little more. Um, but I just wanna encourage people, and, and Lachlan, I, I appreciate any comments you have on this, that you know, this after COVID, we have this opportunity. It changed the game a little bit. At least it opened the door, I think, a little bit wider. And I think that's why the Dignity Alliance has been so effective um, it, it, the amount of work that you've done in this, this really short time is really astounding. So I think just building on that and making sure we say what we want is really important at this point. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Ellen. Lachlan, you I want to thank fun? everybody. I do have to jump to another meeting, but Paul, if you could graciously wrap up, I would appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. The, one, the one thing is just Ellen, Paul called me to say, I, I think I'm a kiss, keep it simple, stupid person, or I try to be. Um, I think what this is all about is the voices of every person in this commonwealth are of equal value, need to be heard, um, uh, uh, and with Zoom and other efforts and the networks that we all have, we can have those voices be heard in ways where there's no excuse 
uh, anymore for anyone to say, we haven't heard, we haven't listened, um, and all the rest will be details that follow from that. Well said, Michael. Um, well, I wanted to um, thank all of you for not only joining um, in this conversation today, but for um, what each and every one of you do in your own uh, um, ways to to um, further the notion of dignity and in, in people's ability to, to lead their lives as fully as as, uh, as they um, are able to. Um, and uh, for your, your for, I think most of the folks on the call right now um, have been involved in some fashion with um, Dignity Alliance, and we're very grateful for that. I mean, as 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 horrific and, and and tragic the pandemic has been for literally hundreds of thousands of folks, um, some of the, the positive that comes out of it is bringing together uh, the, the folks um, that are on this call and many others in a collective effort to 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 try to make um, our circumstances a bit better. Um, and um, so th that's that's one of the, the, the positives. I, th I think um, I, was, I was raised always to be, look for every civil lining that, 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 could, that can be. Um, I've been impressed by the, the diversity of perspectives um, that um, both personally and uh, from pr professional activity that has been shared today. Um, I think that's um, what, one of the things that makes um, the, the work of Dignity Alliance uh, potentially as effective um, as I think it has been and in, in, in looking into the future even more so uh, as we affect uh, public policy and uh, our protocols and practices um, throughout the Commonwealth in terms of um, in providing services to people who need it no matter what their um, the circumstances are. Um, for those of you who haven't been involved with Dignity Alliance, we invite you. Um, you can connect with us through um, our website, which is dignityalliancema.org, or you can send an email to info, I-N-F-O, at dignityalliancema.org, and we'll get you involved. And, and uh, at the very least, um, you can get a, a, the free um, weekly um, uh, Tuesday Digest, which is a compilation of all this information around um, the type of topics that we've been discussing today. I would, um, this is the first time we've done this type of sort of unscripted, unagended Zoom session. I, I for one, have found it very valuable. Um, I, and, and I think um, I want to thank Lachlan and Sam and Priscilla for organizing it. And I hope that this will be repeated, not once a year, but more frequently. Um, both open-ended like this and, and and from time to time on specific uh, uh, topics and issues that we'll explore in, in more de depth than, than we can in the uh, our bi-weekly uh, more structured uh, Zoom sessions. So um, I'm, I don't want to have the last word. I'm going to open it up to anybody who would like to um, share um, a closing perspective. Thank you for the, the how about Lisa Iazoni? You want to just, you, you've been very quiet throughout this. You want to close this out? Well, I just really value listening to every voice that I've heard this afternoon. It's just been really remarkable. And I want to say that this is a universal experience that every single person will experience throughout their lifespan, what we've talked about today. And so that's why it's so kind of amazing to me that the rest of the people don't get it. You know, that this is universal. Every single one of us um, will hopefully live many years like your grandparents did, Paul, although some of us won't. And, and so I just urge us to take the time to listen to each other like we have this afternoon. So thank you so much to everybody for sharing. It's just been a very powerful and meaningful afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, and thank you, everybody. And Sam, do you just want to uh, close up with some technical, you know, I think this has been recorded and how that's going to be available and et cetera. And Priscilla, I see Priscilla's hand raised, so. So I'll turn it over to the two of you. I was just, I was just clapping to what Lisa just said, so it wasn't a <laughs> hand raised. Go ahead, Sam. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm having 
I'm having some technical problems on my end, um, but I just wanted to, uh, yes, this meeting was recorded and we will be sharing it with everybody who registered. Um, and I hope, I know I'll be revisiting um, the recording. I just thank you all for sharing your thoughts. I, this was, I knew this would be an impactful discussion, but it really touched me and I'm just grateful to have heard all of everybody's perspectives. So thank you. Okay. And thank you, Great. Paul, for facilitating this, for moderating. Okay. And I don't know what happened last night, but it better not happen again tonight. Go Sox. <laughs> <laughs> Go Sox. <laughs> All righty. Bye-bye. Win with dignity. All right. <laughs> yeah, win with dignity. You can lose with dignity, but it's better to win with dignity. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.